start the live stream. And um, okay, we're we're good to begin. Um, welcome everyone to the Office of Tax Appeals. Today's oral hearing is for the appeal of Redwood Memorial Hospital Incorporated. I'm Judge Teresa Stanley, and I'm the lead judge for purposes of conducting today's proceedings. The panel includes myself and Judge Andrew Kui and Judge Mike Lee, all three of us whom will be equally deliberating and deciding this appeal. Our stenographer, Ms. Esquivel Parkinson, is also present today and will report this hearing word for word. To ensure we have an accurate record, we ask that everyone speaks one at a time, do not speak over any other speaker, and speak directly into the microphone. I'm sorry, with these microphones, you kind of have to have it right up in your face. Um, but they do bend, so you can <laughs> you might make that work for you. Um, if needed, Ms. Esquivel Parkinson will stop the hearing and ask for clarification. After the hearing, Ms. Esquivel Parkinson will produce the official hearing transcript, which will be available on the Office of Tax Appeals website. So we're going to go ahead and jump into this and go on the record at this point. Um, again, this is appeal, appeals of, appeal of Redwood Memorial Hospital, Inc. The case number is 21037436. The date is January 24th, 2023, and the time is about 9.30 a.m. Um, here in Sacramento, California. Um, again, I'm Judge Teresa Stanley, and Judge Andrew Kui and Judge Mike Lee are also on the panel. I will conduct the proceedings, but the panel will equally deliberate and issue a written opinion within 100 days after the record closes. Um, let's uh, have everybody identify themselves for the record, starting with appellant. Randy Ferris, Ernst & Young for appellant. Mark Steffen, Ernst & Young for appellate. Sarah Gaudreau, Ernst & Young for appellate. And CDTFA. Amanda Jacobs, uh, Tax Council 3 with the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration. Scott Claremont with the CDTFA. And Jason Parker, Chief of Headquarters Operations Bureau with CDTFA. Okay, and um, I, I just want everybody to know that they can, they can um, just jump in if you have any questions about how the proceedings are going or if you think I've missed something. Um, I'm going to welcome everyone to the Office of Tax Appeals, or OTA as we lovingly call it. Um, OTA is an independent agency um, that has no affiliation with CDTFA or any other tax agency. OTA is not a court, but we're an independent appeals agency staffed with our own tax experts. The only evidence in OTA's record is what was submitted in this appeal which all three judges have uh, reviewed. The proceedings are being live streamed on YouTube. Our stenographer, Ms. Esquivel Parkinson, is recording the proceedings. So once again, speak directly into your microphone, speak loudly and clearly, and uh, hopefully she can catch every word. Um, the issues to be decided in this appeal are as follows. Um, the, the issue is whether appellant is entitled to a refund of the tax and or tax reimbursement it paid on its purchases of tangible personal property provided to patients covered by Medicare Part A. And appellant um, in their pre-hearing conference statement listed five sub-issues that I'm gonna go ahead and read into the record so that we can make sure that we um, consider those in our deliberations and opinion. Um, it's appellant's understanding that the following principal material facts and issues are in dispute. Number one, whether for periods prior to January 1st, 2019, title passage clauses and contracts between medical service facilities and Medicare Part A patients are relevant with respect to meeting the requirements of the exemption provided under Revenue and Taxation Code Section 6381 and Regulation Section 1614F. Um, 
And number two, whether a requirement for such title passage clauses with Medicare Part A patients would effectively and improperly invalidate the Medicare Part A exemption because such a requirement would impermissibly treat Medicare Part A patients as federal instrumentalities. Number three, whether if title passage clauses with Medicare Part A patients are not relevant for operating the Medicare Part A exemption for periods prior to January 1, 2019, a requirement that title passage clauses exist in contracts between medical service facilities and the United States government would effectively and improperly invalidate the exemption because such title passage clauses have never existed since the exemption first became operative in 1966. Number four, whether re regulation section 1503B and 1591F2 are interpretive regulations pursuant to the classification set forth in Yamaha, Yamaha Corp of America versus the State Board of Equalization and are invalid to the extent they cannot be harmonized with the Medicare Part A exemption provided under Revenue and Taxation Code Section 6381 and Regulation 1614F. Uh, and lastly, number five, whether any indicia of an intent to make an exempt sale of medical supplies to the United States government under Medicare Part A is required other than identifying the subject medical supplies to the United States government as part of the established Medicare Part A reimbursement procedures and receiving a corresponding payment from the United States government. Uh, Mr. Ferris, does this, this accurately represent the issues as you see them? Yes, Judge Stanley. And Ms. Jacobs, um, does CDTFA agree that those are the issues that have been raised? Uh, yes, we agree. Um, okay. We also had um, some pre-hearing stipulations in this case, and um, I'm going to read those and make sure that the parties still agree. Um, number one, um, the parties agree that no title passage clauses exist between appellant and Medicare Part A patients for the claim period at issue, and that no title passage clauses exist between appellant and the United States government for the claim period at, at issue. That it, um, since this was proposed by appellant, I'll ask you, Ms. Jacobs, does the department still agree to that? We do. Okay, and CDTFA, well, I, I, won't, I, I won't need to read into the record the parts that uh, CDTFA did not agree to, but after the pre-hearing conference, CDTFA reviewed transactions um, in appellant's exhibits 9 through 16 and agreed that those exhibits are sufficient to establish that appellant was charged tax or tax reimbursement and that it paid the tax or tax reimbursement to its vendors in these seven particular transactions. Um, is that correct, Ms. Jacobs? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Judge um, Stanley? I should probably add that if you add up all of the tax amounts for those seven transactions, uh, the amount is $50.58. Okay. Thank you for the clarification or addition. Um, so at the hearing, at the pre-hearing conference, um, we had uh, appellants exhibits one through 16 and CDTFA did not object. Um, so if there's no ob objection today, Ms. Jacobs? No objection. Those will be entered into evidence despite the um, minutes and orders that stated that only eight of them would be. Um, so uh, CDTFA submitted Exhibits A through F, an appellant did not object to those exhibits. Is that still accurate, Mr. Ferris? Yes, it is. Moving right along. Okay, and um, I want to point out for the record and for the public that neither party is presenting any witnesses today, so there will only be 
um, a presentation and no witnesses will be sworn in under oath or affirmation. Um, we're going to start with uh, appellant's presentation. So, Mr. Ferris, when you're ready, you may proceed. Thank you. Honorable panel, appellant is seeking a refund for tax paid purchases resold deductions. Closer. Honorable panel, appellant is seeking a refund for tax paid purchases resold deductions arising from tax and tax reimbursement appellant paid to its vendors on purchases of medical supply items. Appellant later sold these items to the federal government in non-taxable transactions pursuant to the Medicare Part A exemption provided under Revenue and Taxation Code Section 6381 and Sales and Use Tax Regulation 1614 Subdivision F. The department denied appellant's refund because, over the years since the Part A exemption first became operative in 1966, the department has inadvertently lost connection with the statutory basis for the Part A exemption. Unmoored from the statutory basis for the Part A exemption, the department now clings to irrelevant language about patient title passage clauses in Regulation 1503, Subdivision B2C, in hopes that the OTA will defer to an administrative error made by the department's staff back in 2001. Appellant respectfully urges the OTA not to defer to this administrative error and to compel the department to return to the statutory mooring of Section 6381 as implemented by Regulation 1614F. There's an old story uh, about the importance of questioning the assumptions behind traditional approaches that speaks to how the department became unmoored from the statutory basis of the Part A exemption. In the story, a young girl notices her mother cutting off the ends of a roast before putting it into a pot to cook in the oven. The child had seen her mother do this before when preparing pot roast dinners, but she had never thought to ask her mother about it. This time she did. Her mom replied, that's a great question. You know, I don't know why I always cut all the ends off, but that's the way your grandma always did it. And I picked it up from her. You should call your grandma and ask her. So the curious girl called up her grandma and got the same response. Grandma cut off the pot roast ends because she had noticed that her mother had always cut the ends off. Fortunately, the curious and persistent girl was blessed with longevity in her family. So she called up her great-grandmother. To the girl's delight, the great-grandmother did not say that she cut the ends off because that's what the way her mother always did it, nor did she offer some explanation like, I believed that the meat would become more flavorful that way. Rather, the great-grandmother responded, when your great-grandfather and I had our first apartment, we had a small kitchen with a very small oven, and the pot roast wouldn't fit in the oven unless I cut the ends off first. So, <laughs> how did the department become unmoored from Section 6381, the statutory basis of the Part A exemption, resulting in the 2001 staff error that asserted that title passage clauses with Part A patients were relevant to the operation of the Part A exemption, or in the folksy language of the pot roast story, how did it come to pass that the department started cutting off the ends of the pot roast? A bit of historical context is pertinent here. At the time the existence of the Part A exemption was first acknowledged in 1966 by annotation 505.0820, the rule, since 1933, had been that medical service facilities made retail sales of tangible personal property, or TPP, when they made separately stated charges for TPP on their billing documents. That's why the 1966 annotation provided that the Part A exemption was available for all TPP identified to the federal government for billing purposes under Part A, for which payment was made by the federal government. This 1966 annotation makes it clear that the basis of the exemption is the existence of direct contracts between the federal government and the medical service facilities serving Part A patients and that the Part A patients are not being treated as federal instrumentalities. If Medicare patients were federal instrumentalities, then part, Medicare Part B transactions would also be eligible for exemption, which they are clearly not. The department's confusion apparently started around 1970 when, without any reference to Part A transactions or to Section 6381, the department modified the 1933 rule with a new rule under Regulation 1503. 
This new rule provided that medical service facilities made retail sales of TPP when they made separately stated charges both for TPP and for charges to administer the separately stated TPP to a patient. The annotations cited by Department's Exhibit F make it clear that during this time, staff understandably focused on how patients were being billed to determine whether a retail sale of TPP had occurred or not. Unfortunately, as discussed uh, on, in detail on pages 72 and 73 of Appellant's Exhibit 2, this patient billing focus began to taint the way st staff started analyzing the requirements for the Part A exemption. Annotation 300.0130 is the most salient example of this tainted analysis. Thus, staff started focusing on patient billing when analyzing the availability of the Part A exemption without considering whether it was proper to treat Part A patients as federal instrumentalities. And just like that, the ends of the pot roast were chopped off. Having lost the tether to Section 6381, the staff error that ultimately occurred in 2001 was somewhat understandable. In 2001, staff proposed to abandon the administered versus non-administered rule promulgated in 1970 and to replace it with the Tidal Passage Clause rule that is currently found in Regulation 1503 B2C. Tidal Passage Clauses have never existed in the Part A contracts between the federal government and participating medical service facilities. So when the question arose during the 2001 Interested Parties process as to whether the proposed Title Passage Clause rule could un unintentionally abrogate the party exemption, as explained in Department's Exhibit F, staff's proposed solution to this problem was to suggest that medical service facilities could operate the party exemption by, quote, including an explicit clause in the contract between the facility and the patient transferring title to medical supply items to the patient, end quote. In other words, mom had seen what grandma had done with the mistaken focus on patient billing and handed this patient-focused approach down to the next generation with the improper solution of suggesting that title passage clauses with Part A patients could somehow be relevant to operating the Part A exemption. And so, here we are now, 20 years, over 20 years later, at a hearing where the OTA is being asked to defer to staff's 2001 error. The department's unmooring from section 6381 as the statutory basis of the Part A exemption is manifestly illustrated by the rulemaking histories of regulations 1503 and 1591. As reflected by the reference sections that precede each of the department's publicly available sales and use tax regulations, regulations 1503 and 1591 do not reference section 6381. Only Regulation 1614 references Section 6381 because Regulation 1614F is the true quasi-legislative touchstone. Regulation 1614F is the quasi-legislative regulation that in 1980 officially codified the Part A exemption first acknowledged in 1966 by annotation 505.0820. Regulation 1614F makes it clear that Medicare patients cannot be treated as federal instrumentalities by emphasizing that Part B transactions are not eligible for exemption. Again, this is because the basis for the exemption is the direct contract with the federal government under Part A. The exemption is not based on treating Part A patients as federal instrumentalities. Even more telling, when the department amended regulations 1503 and 1591 in the year 2021 to address staff's concerns about how the Part A exemption was being administered, the department made no changes to the quasi-legislative Medicare Part A exemption provision set forth in regulation 1614F. Now, it should be noted that even though footnote 16 of the Appeals Bureau's initial decision indicates that Part A patients cannot be treated as federal instrumentalities, and even though the Appeals Bureau's supplemental decision rejecting using title passage clauses with Part A patients to operate the Part, to operate the part A exemption 
Notwithstanding that, at the pre-hearing conference, the department was unwilling to concede that Part A patients cannot be treated as federal instrumentalities. It should also be noted that the department's Exhibit F cites and quotes the same U.S. Supreme Court cases that appellant relies on with regard to the extremely narrow circumstances under which a person or entity can be considered to be a federal instrumentality. Per the holding of United States v. New Mexico, Part A patients could only be federal instrumentalities if they cannot be realistically viewed as separate entities for purposes of operating the exemption. That's why the Appeals Bureau's supplemental decision was correctly adamant that Part A patients could not be conflated with the federal government. And this is also why the Appeals Bureau rejected the use of patient title passage clauses to operate the Part A exemption. All this raises the following obvious question. If Part A patients are not federal instrumentalities, why is the department now defending the position that the Part A exemption operates when direct sales of TPP are made to Part A patients through express title, patient, express title passage clauses with Part A patients? Perhaps the department was unwilling to, to concede that Part A patients are not federal instrumentalities because the department is concerned that if this panel considers the federal instrumentality issue to be relevant, the department is unlikely to prevail on the merits. In other words, the department's reluctance to engage on the federal instrumentality issue might be the department's way of attempting to have its chopped up pot roast and eat it too. As discussed in more detail in appellant's briefs, under the classification set forth in the California Supreme Court's Yamaha decision, Regulation 1614F is a quasi-legislative regulation because it involves a discretionary rulemaking action to effectuate the purpose of Section 6381. Section 6381 provides an exemption only for direct retail sales of TPP to the U.S. government and its agencies and instrumentalities. Section 6381 was enacted in 1943 and does not expressly address the application of tax to transactions involving medical patients insured by a federal program like Medicare Part A. Medicare Parts A and B did not come into existence until 23 years after Section 6381 was enacted. Thus, to effectuate the purpose of Section 6381, the Department used quasi-legislative authority to mandate that transactions that could theoretically be considered to be sales of TPP to patients insured under Part A must instead be considered to be direct exempt sales to the federal government by operation of law. In contrast, 21 years after the Part A exemption was officially codified in Regulation 1614F, when the Department promulgated Regulation 1503B2 in 2001, the Department was merely interpreting the general application of the true object test set forth in Regulation 1501 as applied to medical service facilities. In fact, Regulation 1501 concludes with this statement, quote, examples of service enterprises and regulations pertaining thereto will be found in regulations which follow, end quote. Given its close proximity to Regulation 1501 in the California Code of Regulations, no doubt exists that Regulation 1503B is further interpreting the application of the true object test to the activities of medical service facilities. As, as explained by the Supreme Court in Yamaha, a regulation that construes another regulation is an interpretive regulation. Accordingly, Regulation 1503B must be an interpretive regulation, not a quasi-legislative regulation. The OTA must follow the regulatory classifications established by the Supreme Court in Yamaha and, if a conflict exists, must give greater authoritative weight to the quasi-legislative regulations. When the OTA issued its presidential op opinion in Talavera in 2020, the OTA held that it cannot declare quasi-legislative regulations invalid and must treat them with the dignity of statutes. Because Regulation 1614F is a quasi-legislative regulation and Regulation 1503B2 is an interpretive regulation, the OTA is precluded from deferring to the 2001 error of the department's staff on which the department's position in the instant matter is based. The OTA has the authority to invalidate the application of Regulation 1503B2 to Part A transactions to the extent it conflicts with Section 
6381 and Regulation 1614F, because Regulation 1503 is merely an interpretive regulation. This is so because the OTA's own Regulation 30104 Subdivision A is clear that the OTA only lacks the jurisdiction to invalidate statutes and, per Talavera, quasi-legislative regulations. However, in this particular case, the OTA can uphold the rule of law without having to invalidate any provision of Regulation 1503b2. Let me explain. It is, it is one thing to look at a Part A transaction and say, okay, I see a transfer of possession, whether constructive or actual, to a Part A patient with consideration being paid by the federal government. I could consider this to be an intent to make a sale of TPP to the Part A patient with third party consideration being paid by the federal government. But Regulation 1614F tells me that even though I could theoretically characterize the transaction as a sale to the Part A patient, Section 6381 mandates that I instead consider the transaction to be a direct sale to the federal government with title passing directly to the federal government by operation of law. This approach, which is faithful to Section 6381 and Regulation 1614F, avoids treating the Part A patient as a federal instrumentality. This approach just acknowledges that the, trans that the transaction could be analyzed in more than one way, but that Section 6381 mandates that the transaction be treated as a direct exempt sale to the federal government because of the Part A contracts between the federal government and the participating medical service facilities. In contrast, given that title passage clauses have never existed between participating medical service facilities and the federal government, it is quite another thing to say that the Part A exemption will only operate if express title passage clauses exist between Part A patients and medical service facilities. Under this alternative scenario, there are not two ways to analyze the facts. Here, we have an unambiguous direct transfer of title to t TPP to Part A patients that is then deemed to be a sale to the federal government. Such a result would only be appropriate if Part A patients were federal instrumentalities, but they are not. This approach is not faithful to Section 6381 and Regulation 1614F. As discussed in more detail in appellant's briefs, there is a way that Regulations 1614F, 1503B2, and 1591F2A can all be harmonized without negating the Part A exemption provided under Section 6381. Regulation 1503 provides rules for when medical service facilities are consumers and for when they are retailers. Regulation 1503B1 says that one needs to look at Subdivision B2, which is which is comprised of subparagraphs A through D to determine when medical service when a med medical service facility is acting as a retailer. Subparagraph B to B has no relevance to the Part A exemption because this provision only addresses certain sales of TPP to discharged patients. For example, items like wheelchairs and crutches who will then use the TPP off the premises of the subject medical service facility. Part, part A only applies to inpatient care. To the extent transactions addressed by subparagraph B2B are paid for by the federal government, such sales would be taxable under Part B of the Medicare Act if the transaction is not otherwise exempt. Thus, subparagraph B2B is inapplicable to Part A transactions. Subparagraph B2D is also inapplicable to the instant appeal. This provision expressly provides that it only addresses transactions occurring on and after January 1st, 2019. The claim period at issue is July 1st, 2013 through December 31st, 2018. Accordingly, none of the transactions in dispute could potentially be affected by subparagraph B2D. So what about the department's misguided pot roast recipe found in B2C? which focuses on the existence of title passage clauses to determine whether a sale has occurred. Even though the department was unwilling to concede this point at the pre-hearing conference, the department knows that title passage clauses have never existed between medical service facilities and the federal government. 
That is why staff's erroneous solution in 2001 was to improperly suggest that medical service facilities could operate the Part A exemption by entering into express title passage clauses with their Part A patients. In other words, staff was well aware that title passage clauses with the federal government under Part A had never been an option. Staff's erroneous solution proposed in 2001 is inapplicable because Part A patients are not federal instrumentalities. It should also be noted that the Appeals Bureau expressly rejected this erroneous solution in faithfulness to the well-established canons of construction that preclude relying on plain language interpretations that lead to absurd results. So, subparagraphs B2B, C, and D cannot be reasonably harmonized with Section 6381 and Regulation 1614F. That leaves subparagraph B2A, which provides a medical service facility is the retailer of property furnished to persons other than residents and patients for a charge. This is exactly what happens when a participating medical service facility makes a direct exempt sale to the federal government under Part A. In short, only subparagraph B2A can be properly harmonized with both Regulation 1614F and Regulation 1591F2A without illegally treating Part A patients as federal instrumentalities in contradiction to the statutory authority of 6381. Putting all this together, any transfer of TPP to a Part A patient with consideration paid by the federal government could be analyzed in more than one way. Regulation 1614F tells us that even though we could theoretically characterize the transaction as a sale to the Part A patient with third party consideration paid by the federal government, Section 6381 mandates that we instead consider the, the transaction to be a direct sale to the federal government. This result is also consistent with the rule that treats medical service facilities uh, as retailers under Regulation 1503B2A. Moreover, this approach has the virtue of interpreting the regulations at issue in context, harmonizing to the fullest extent possible all provisions relating to the same subject matter. The Department's focus on subparagraph B2C does not provide a reasonable path to harmonization because it contradicts the statutory basis of Regulation 1614F by treating Part A patients as federal instrumentalities. Finally, under the Department's harmonization approach, any transfer of TPP, any transfer of possession of TPP to Part A patients, whether actual, constructive, joint, or temporary, is sufficient indicia of the requisite intent to make a direct exempt sale to the federal government under Part A. Using the broadest possible concept of transfer of possession is consistent with the statutory amendments the Department made to Regulation 1591 in 1999, which are now reflected in Subdivision F2A. The reference section of Regulation 1591 makes it clear that Regulation 1591 is based in part on Section 6006, which provides that any transfer of possession in any manner or by any means whatsoever is sufficient for a sale to occur. That is why the 1999 amendment found in Regulation 1591 F2A delineates such broad categories of TPP eligible for the Part A exemption, namely all medicines, devices, appliances, and supplies in which payment is made under Part A. It would be inconsistent with the broad categories of eligible TPP to limit the indicia of intent to make direct exempt sales to the federal government under Part A to the likely negligible amount of transactions where actual sole possession of TPP is fully and irrevocably transferred to Part A patients. In sum, with respect to the operation of the Part A exemption, to avoid absurd results like effectively negating the exemption, the interpretive regulations 1503B2 and 1591F2A must always be construed so that they harmonize with the quasi-legislative regulation 1614F and the statutory basis for the exemption found in 6381.
Appellant's harmonization approach is reasonable because it does not treat Part A patients as federal instrumentalities and does not unduly restrict the availability of the Part A exemption when medical service facilities indicate their intent to make a direct exempt sale to the federal government by transferring possession of a medical supply item to a Part A patient. The department's harmonization approach the department's harmonization approach is in direct conflict with section 6381 and must be rejected. Accordingly, appellant respectfully asks that the OTA reverse the department's action in this matter and grant appellant's refund. This concludes appellant's opening statement. Okay, thank you Mr. Ferris. Um, do, um, Judge Kui, do you have any questions? Could you go to Judge Lee first and then come back to me, please? Sure. Thanks. Judge Lee, do you have any questions for appellant? Uh, just uh, no, no questions at this time. <coughs> Judge Quee, do you need a minute still? Uh, okay. Uh, just to make sure I'm understanding, are you also arguing that uh, 1503B2C is invalid and then making a I guess an additional additional argument that uh, the the regulation can be harmonized with uh, sixteen fourteen. So, like, you're making two alternative arguments, or were you only saying that the latter that we could harmonize it with the approach that you? Right. Well, I, yeah. Appellant is saying that uh, B two C is irrelevant to Part A transactions. Right, and it, and it, the only reason why it is there is because of the staff error made in 2001, where they suggested that title passage clauses with patients could operate the Part A exemption. So we believe that it is irrelevant because to Part A because Part A is is 1614F is clear that the sale that's exempt is a direct sale to the United States government. So a solution that involves setting up an entirely separate retail transaction with the patient that is then deemed to be uh, a sale to the federal government, that is treating the, the, the patient as a federal instrumentality improperly. So it's either irrelevant or to the extent, and I guess what we're saying is to the extent OTA thinks it is relevant, it needs, the, even though, even if it may be relevant to non-Part A transactions, right, the OTA should invalidate it as applied to Part A transactions because that approach is completely inconsistent with 1614F and 6381. So I don't know if I'm answering your, your question or not. Okay, I, th I think that helps clarify it. So in the one instance, I think your main primary position is that uh, this regulation 1503 provision doesn't apply to Medicare Part A, but to the extent that OTA were to find that it, it does apply, then because this is interpretive and uh, 1614 is uh, quasi-legislative, you'd ask us to in invalidate it to the extent uh, of Part A Medicare under, I guess, the theory would be the Safe Mart case, which where the board determined that a uh, interpretive regulation was, was invalid. So I guess that would be the authority for for OTA to invalidate a portion of uh, 1503, is that? I guess That's correct. And again, invalid as applied, you know, to Part A transactions. So, but right. I think if if the OTA focuses on B2A as the correct harmonization approach, then um, B2C can be left alone. Uh, it doesn't apply to Part A transactions because it's describing a sale that could never occur under 1614F. So it so it, it clearly has no factual uh, application to a Part A transaction. Okay, and um, it looks like there's been a couple of approaches that were taken the prior to 2001. You had the administered, non-administered. Then we have the B2C, and uh, and then I guess after 2019 we have B2D, where it talks where it looks at possession. Do you know the reasoning? Was there any change in the law? There was no, from my understanding of what you were saying, there's no change in the law that resulted in, in the change in the approach taken in the regulation, and that's why you're giving the example of the pot rose. Correct, yeah. And, and, and in fact, I think that, that what happened with the 2021 amendments, 
uh, makes it clear that uh, the department also thinks that an error occurred in 2001. <laughs> uh, and that's why they uh, want to change the, the focus to, to be more on possession. But they're making that change because they realize that the 2001 suggestion that uh, title passage clauses with Part A patients operating the Part A exemption was not the correct solution. And that's why they, they're making the change that they're making, where they're basically saying the, the title passage clause doesn't have any real substance. And so therefore, uh, we're going to add possession as the, the indicator of the sale. But even then, they're still treating the, uh, the Part A patient effectively as a federal instrumentality because they're very focused on a, a sale by transfer of possession uh, to the Part A patient, whereas what Appellant is saying is that transfer of possession is the indicia of the intent to make a sale under 1614F a direct sale to the federal government. It's not a, it's not a proxy sale. Again, the, the, the transaction can be characterized in multiple ways. You could view it as a direct sale to the patient with third-party consideration paid by the federal government. But 1614F says no. You can't. That would only be correct if Medicare patients are federal instrumentalities. They're not. That's why Part B doesn't have any exemption because there you have Medicare patients and again you can have third-party consideration being paid by the federal government but those are not exempt because there is no direct contract with the federal government and the hospitals with with Part B so it I, I think that the Exhibit F and what they've done uh, with their 2021 amendments actually uh, corroborates appellants position that the 2001 solution was not correct. It was an error. And it was that error was based on the patient-focused billing approach that's, that staff started using after the 1970 amendments to 1503, right? And then that, that patient focus just kind of bled into staff's consciousness, I guess. And so when the question came up, what do we, in 2001, we're, we're getting rid of administered, not administered. Now we're coming up with this new rule about title passage clauses. How does that affect Part A? Uh, and then staff's solution at that time, because their, their minds were steeped in this patient billing focus, right? They just said, well, just make it title passage clause with your Medicare Part A patients. That'll solve your problem if you want to operate the exemption. But that's because staff had lost its, its mooring, its connection to the actual statutory basis of the exemption, which is 6381. Um, you know, and it's, if staff had truly been aware of the touchstone of 6381, they would have amended uh, 1614F at the same time that they amended 1503 and 1591. They didn't. And that's because they have this blind spot about where the exemption comes from. It comes from 6381, and uh, that's, that's what Appellant is, is calling out. Appellant appreciates that it's a big deal for the OTA to consider whether or not the, the department has been on the wrong path for over 50 years. Uh, we appreciate that that is a big deal, but I think the record's clear that they have been on the wrong path since uh, after 1970 and they have been focused on the patient as a federal instrumentality and uh, that's improper right and I guess looking at it from appellant's perspective you're asking us to look at you know um, the indicia which is the transfer of the possession and the direct payment by the government I guess kind of that seems to be <laughs> like an issue there I mean like is that looking at a you know, transfer of uh, you know, a, t a sale like a possession in lieu of title uh, aspect, and I, I don't know. That's just another hard area, I guess. To yeah, it's it, it is difficult. It, you know, there's always been a, a rule, right? For what is the what's the indicia of an intent to make a sale of tangible personal property by a medical service facility? 
From 1933 to 1970, the indicia was, did you separately state the TPP and charge for it in your billing documents? That was the indicia. And when that happened, the, the idea has to be that title to that tangible personal property transferred to the patient. Right. In 1970, the indicia was changed to show that you had an intent to, to make a sell. You had to separately state the TPP and separately state an administration uh, service charge related to that TPP. Right. Then in 2001, the indicia was changed again to focus on uh, title passage clauses, but and that may be well and good with respect to non-Part A transactions, but it is not well and it is not good and it is not proper to apply that type of indicia uh, to make a sale with actual explicit title passage clauses to Part A patients as, you know, that, that doesn't work because it turns the Part A patient into a federal instrumentality. It can't do that. So, Appellant is aware that there's always been something, some sort of sign of indicia, uh, and I guess w with a hat tip to the, the department's uh, 2021 amendments, we think it is you know, proper to, to look at the transfer of possession, again, with a broad concept of what that might mean, of transfer of possession to, uh, to, part, to depart a patient as the indicia of the, the intent to make that direct sale to the United States government. And again, it has the virtue also of excluding things like items of TPP that, that are always under the you know, exclusive control and possession of um, medical staff, like surgical gloves, right? There's never going to be any indicia of an intent to make a sale of those surgical gloves uh, through the transfer of possession to a Part A patient. We're we're appreciative that the department has concerns about an overbroad uh, application of of, uh, of items of tangible personal property that could be considered to be direct sales to the federal government under Part A. So, the using the the concept of uh, possession and transfer of possession again broadly to the Part A patient, uh, I think does is consistent with the the true historical. Uh, background to uh, how medical service facilities have been taxed and you know again sometimes they're consumers and sometimes they're retailers and there's always been a rule about what's the indicia of the intent to, to, to shift from being the consumer to being the retailer and so uh, appellant believes that it's its approach to that indicia to to make a sale is it's is much sounder and more consistent and completely consistent with uh, Regulation 1614F and 6381, whereas the title passage clauses are not. Okay, thank you. I will turn it back to Judge uh, Stanley. Thank you. I, um, I had um, a similar question about the harmonization versus invalidation of regulations, so I don't need that question answered any further but I did wonder about your point with the 21 2021 amendments do you did you review the legislative history to see if um, there's anything in there that would enlighten us about why the department made those amendments I think I mean the department I'm sure will address that uh, themselves but it it's it, exhibit F makes it clear that they they think that the solution of 2001 to focus ex on patient title title passage clauses was was not correct because they don't think uh, patient title clauses have sufficient substance. That's what they say in Exhibit F. Okay, thank you. And Judge Lee, you don't have any follow-up questions? I do not. Thank you. Okay. Um, then let's uh, turn it over to the department for their presentation. You may proceed when you're ready, Ms. Jacobs. morning. Oh, good morning. There we go. <laughs> Appellant, a California corporation, operated a 25-bed critical care access hospital 
which rendered medical services to patients insured under Medicare Part A. The tangible personal property, or TPP, at issue in this case is not medicine, as defined by Section 6369B, but rather medical equipment and supplies. Appellant claims it paid tax or tax reimbursement on the TPP and that the TPP was furnished or used in the provision of services to patients insured under Medicare Part A. During the claim period of July 1, 2013 through December 31, 2018, it is undisputed that none of appellant's contracts with its patients or with the U.S. government contained a title passage clause. The issue in this appeal, as stated in the pre-hearing conference minutes and or orders, is whether appellant is t entitled to a refund of the tax and or tax reimbursement it paid on its purchases of TPP provided to patients covered by Medicare Part A, or stated differently, whether appellant consumed or resold the TPP to the U.S. government in connection with services rendered to its Medicare Part A patients during the liability period. Regulation 1503 sets forth the application of tax to medical service facilities, including hospitals. 1503b1 states, Operative April 1, 2001, except as provided in Subdivision B2, Medical service facilities are service providers to their patients and residents, including patients and residents insured pursuant to Part A of the Medicare Act, and are the consumers of tangible personal property furnished in connection with those services. Subdivision B2C goes on to state, quote, a medical service facility is the retailer of any property furnished in connection with its medical services if its contract with the medical service facility's resident or patient or other customer specifically provides that title to the subject tangible personal property passes to the resident or patient or other customer. When the contract has a provision passing title to the subject tangible personal property to the resident or patient or other customer, the medical services facility may purchase such property for resale and tax applies to the charge by the medical services facility unless its sale is otherwise exempt from tax." End quote. We note that these rules are generally to the benefit of medical service facilities in that it simplifies their transactions with patients and sets the measure of tax on the cost to them unless they specifically intended to be a retailer. As described in Exhibit D, the version of Regulation 1503 in effect prior to April 1, 2001 distinguishes, distinguished between whether medical service facilities made separately stated charges for administered and non-administered items, and the department and interested parties agreed that default rule, making medical service facilities the consumer of the TPP, was preferable. See Exhibit D, page 8. As you know, according to Section 6381, Sales of TPP to the U.S. government are exempt from tax. With regard to TPP furnished to patients insured under Medicare Part A, Regulation 1591 F2A states, tax does not apply to the sale of items to a person insured under Medicare Part A because, quote, such sales are considered exempt sales to the United States government, end quote. Similar language is included in Regulation 1614F, and this language first appeared in this form in the 1980 Amendments to 1614. 1591F2A goes on to state, quote, Under Part A, the health care provider has a contract with the U.S. government to provide certain services. Therefore, to the extent allowed, pursuant to Regulation 1503, Sales of medicines, devices, appliances, and supplies in which payment is made under Part A qualify as exempt sales to the United States government." End quote. In sum, Regulations 1591 and 1614 apply the exemption set forth in, 63, in Section 6381 to sales of TPP to Medicare Part A patients, which are considered to be sales to the U.S. government. But for those provisions to apply, there must be a sale in the first place. Neither regulation prescribes any rules or requirements for when such a sale is made by a medical service facility. Certainly, neither states that all TPP furnished or used in the provision of services to a Part A patient constitutes a sale. 
Rather, as with all medical service facility transactions, when a sale is made to a Part A patient is determined by Regulation 1503. In addition to being explicitly stated in Regulations 1503b1 and 1591f2a, this basic interplay between the three regulations is clearly described in Annotations 300.0130, dated November 25, 1991, and the backup letter to Annotation 300.0007.0001. dated April 30, 1992. As discussed in those annotations, an exempt sale to the U.S. government only took place subject to the administered versus non-administered provisions, which had been in effect since 1970. Even under that rubric, furnishing administered TPP for a separately stated charge did not constitute a sale. The application of Regulation 1503 to Medicare Part A transactions was also discussed in the 2001 rulemaking documents for the amendments to Regulation 1503, adding the title passage provision. Specifically, the July 26, 2000 Formal Issue Paper, Exhibit D, which states on page 4 that the Medicare Part A exemption would not apply when a medical service facility acts as a consumer. However, medical service facilities will still have the option to be a retailer by including an explicit clause in the contract between the facility and the patient transferring title to medical supplies items to the patient. In other words, the intent of the 2001 amendments was to replace the administered versus not administered provisions with a title passage provision set forth in subdivision B2C with regard to Medicare Part A transactions. So, pursuant to Regulation 1503, appellant is the consumer of the TPP it furnished to all patients unless one of the specific exceptions set forth in subdivision B2 applies. Because appellant's contracts did not contain title passage clauses to either the patient or the U.S. government, subdivision B2C does not apply. Therefore, under the express language of Regulations 1503, 1591, and 1614, appellant was the consumer, not the retailer, of the TPP at issue. And for these reasons, the appeal should be denied. Now I will turn to some of appellant's arguments. Appellant cites, cites to one sentence from annotation 505.0820. This annotation simply distinguishes between the two types of Medicare at that time, Part A, where there's a payment by the U.S. government, and Part B, where there's reimbursement. This is the same distinction between Medicare Parts A and B recognized in Regulations 1591 and 1614 which effectively supersede this annotation. As I have discussed, appellant's interpretation is contrary to the plain language of these relevant regulations and the actual administration of tax going back as far as 1970 when the administered versus non-administered distinction was adopted. If anything, it was the promulgation of those rules in 1970 that signals an original intent with regard to Medicare Part A transactions. Furthermore, Regulations 1614 and 1503 are not in conflict, as appellant argues. 1614 relates to an exemption, describing what type of sale is considered an exempt sale to the U.S. government. And 1503 defines when such a sale occurs. Appellant's assertion that 1614 is more specific is essentially meaningless because the two regulations have entirely different effects. Furthermore, Yamaha Corporation of America versus State Board of Equalization does not state that a quasi-legislative quasi regulation controls when interpreting two valid regulations, and appellant has not offered any other authority for that proposition. Rather, for the purpose of judicial review of a particular regulation, Yamaha classifies types of regulations on a spectrum between quasi-legislative and interpretive for determining the standard of review a court should apply in assessing the validity of regulation. We also note that Yamaha specifically discusses as quasi-legislative a regulation that, like 1503, 
determines when a sale occurs by requiring objective evidence of the transaction. Nor do we agree that a regulation applying a broad statute to a specific type of transaction, as the relevant provisions of Regulation 1591 and 1614 do here, is necessarily quasi-legislative. Appellant has also argued that the only relevant provision of 1503 to this case is subdivision B2A, which states that, quote, a medical service facility is the retailer of, pr of property furnished to persons other than residents and patients for a charge, end quote. This argument has no basis in either the language of the regulation or its history. Subdivision B2A, by its plain language, is discussing transactions with persons who are not patients, who might, for example, purchase non-prescription medicine, medical supplies, or other TPP at the hospital pharmacy. There is nothing in the regulatory materials, or again, in the actual application of the law since 2001, to suggest that this provision applies to transactions involving patients at all. And given that this is the only scenario in which appellant's theory would apply, appellant is essentially asking us to consider it to be an unstated Medicare provision that, it, that was intended to exempt all Medicare sales without actually mentioning Medicare and without any comment to that effect in the rulemaking file. This is especially absurd given that the regula regulatory materials do specifically mention Medicare Part A with respect to the subdivision B to see title passage provision, which leads us to appellant's argument that by allowing title passage clauses to patients, we are somehow finding patients to be federal instrumentalities. Appellant is attempting to complicate the issue when the plain language of 1591 and 1614 is clear. 1591 and 1614 state that sales of TPP to Medicare Part A patients are considered exempt sales to the U.S. government, not that they are sales to the U.S. government. And by its own provision, 1591 directs us to 1503 to determine when such sales occur. Nowhere in these regulations or their histories does the word instrumentalities appear. The department is bound to follow its own regulations, and as an administrative agency, OTA does not have authority to find the department's validly promulgated regulations invalid. See Government Code Sections 11350B and 15672, as well as the cases New Co Leasing Incorporated versus State Board of Equalization, 143 Cal App 3D 120, and Appeal of Talavera 2020-OTA-0. 22P and Appeal of Missile Laboratories Incorporated 2020-OTA-290P. We also note that appellants' various arguments are somewhat at odds with each other. On the one hand, appellant argues that a sale to the patient cannot be considered a sale to the U.S. government pursuant to the express language of Regulations 1591 and 1614, but appellant also argues that despite there being no title passage clause between hospitals and the U.S. government, title must pass as a matter of law. Appellant apparently has no issue with there being a reasonable interpretation of this exemption. It just doesn't agree with the one expressly set forth in law and actually followed for many decades. In sum, because appellant's contracts did not contain title passage clauses under the express language of Regulation 1503, Appellant was the consumer, not the retailer, of the TPP at issue. Therefore, Appellant is not entitled to a refund, regardless of whether possession of the TPP transferred to the patient. However, as we've discussed in our January 21, 2022 brief and Exhibit E, to the extent OTA considers whether possession of the specific items have transferred, we do not concede that possession transferred with every item Appellant put forward in Exhibit 4 and in fact, there is no evidence that possession transferred for those items. And on a related note, despite our concession that Exhibits 9 through 16 are sufficient to establish that appellant was charged and paid the tax or tax reimbursement in those seven transactions, we still cannot concede that there is any entitlement to the refund amount requested because the department has not conducted a full refund examination 
as we discussed in our briefs. For the reasons I have outlined, we maintain that appellant has not met its burden of proving that it is entitled to a refund for the tax or tax reimbursement it paid on its purchase and consumption of the TPP at issue and request that this appeal be denied. Thank you. Thank, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, Ms. Jacobs. Um, Judge Lee, do you have any questions for the department? Uh, yes, w one question. Uh, what is the department's position on whether 1614F is a quasi-legislative reg or interpretive reg? As as Ms. Jacobs alluded to, it's a it's a generally a quasi legislative le regulation is one where there's an express grant of quasi legislative authority. That doesn't appear to be the case here. It's a regulation that's interpreting a broad exemption for a specific set of facts. So, um, although we don't think it's relevant for this matter, because we think both all the regulations at issue are valid. Uh, we, we're not sure, and as Yamaha discusses, it, it falls in a spectrum. It's not just one or the other. So, it's we're not we don't really have a clear answer to where on that spectrum it falls. Okay, so it sounds like you're saying on that spectrum it falls closer to the interpretive reg side. Uh, yeah, we we believe it's an interpretive reg in that it it is interpreting a broad exemption for a specific factual situation. Okay, thank you. And uh, um, sa same question for 1503. Again, I don't, I don't know if, again, we don't have necessarily a, a ranking on that spectrum. We do think it also falls within that spectrum. As Yamaha discusses with regard to another regulation that discusses when a sale takes place, Yamaha discusses that other regulation, and I, I don't have the, um, the specific regulation on point. It had to do with but it d does have to do with when there's uh, objective indication that a sale takes place, and it was discussing it as quasi-legislative. But there's also interpretive elements, so we do think it also falls on that spectrum. But I don't think we have an answer necessarily because we aren't a court as to where exactly they fall relative to each other on that spectrum. Thank you. No further questions. Judge Kui, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question for CDTFA. So. From your opening presentation, um, my understanding of CDTFA's position and following up on um, Judge Lee's question is that uh, OTA lacks jurisdiction to decline to follow a portion of 1503B2C regardless of whether it's interpretive or quasi-legislative. Is, is that a correct understanding of CDTFA's position? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, I also did want to get a little clarification on the 1503B2 um, A, B, C, D, I uh, is, it, and I'm just wondering, so with Medicare Part A, would that only fall under, um, you know, like a B2C scenario, or is it possible Medicare Part A could fall under 1503B2A um, or B2B? Um, you know, B2A was the medical f service facility where they're uh, retailer for nursing property to persons other than residents. Could that even apply to Medicare Part A? Um, again, our, I, I'm, we are not experts in the scope of the, of, of the actual administration of Medicare Part A. Um, it, it, pro it appears that it would not, B2A would not apply because in, in our opinion, B, what B2A is simply saying is that before you get to patients and residents, it's simply kind of a, an almost obvious rule that sales to non-patients and non-residents are retail sales or furnishing to non-patients and non-residents outside of that the service of of, um, of inpatient medical care. Uh, I do think B two B, and I, I don't know, but B two B appears like it could apply because it could be a property that is furnished to a patient while they are receiving. Um, inpatient care, but that there is an intention to take it outside the hospital. But again, we are not experts in the scope of, of the Medicare programs. Okay. I, I was just trying to, um, s I guess, clarify my understanding of the focus of the dispute was really centered on the title passage provision in B2B.
see um, or if there was a, a, I guess a mix where Medicare Part A but I guess maybe that's may not not too important uh, to the issue so thank you for the clarification I don't believe I have any further questions so I will turn it back to Judge Stanley Okay, I don't have any questions, so what we're going to do is go ahead and uh, give Mr. Ferris the opportunity to respond and give have the final word. Thank you. Uh, I guess I would start by saying, in, in terms of quasi-legislative regulations, uh, I, I'm pretty familiar with the sales and use tax regulations, I can't think of an example of a more bold and brash quasi-legislative move uh, by the Board of Equalization than when they promulgated 1614F and, and said that, you know, this, that me the Medicare Part A program that had been established 23 years earlier, that that, uh, once it became operative in 1966, that those were going to be con considered to be direct sales, exempt sales uh, to the federal government. That is very bold, very brash. That is uber gap-filling discretionary power uh, of, of uh, an enormous uh, scale that, that they did uh, to do that. It wasn't just a mere, oh, we're interpreting 6381. I mean, it, it, that, was, that was a true exercise of uh, discretionary power to uh, call out a new exemption that isn't expressly uh, specifically you know uh, uh, enacted by the legislature it is consistent with 6381 but the fact that they did that was was very uh, very much a quasi legislative move and uh, Fifteen oh three and fifteen ninety one are nowhere uh, in that scale of of boldness. It's they're just piggybacking. Uh, fifteen ninety one F two A is just piggybacking off of sixteen fourteen uh, F and uh, fifteen oh three until uh, their their twenty uh, twenty one amendments had no reference to to Part A at all. And uh, and I think it's very telling when they say uh, that. The way they read 1614F and 1591 F2A, the, the, I believe I heard the department say that they are not sales to the federal government. They're just considered to be sales to the federal government, but they're not sales to the federal government. And if it's not, if they are not sales to the federal government, they can't be exempt because it's only exempt if they are direct sales to the federal government under 6381. This is exactly um, proving th our central point here. Uh, and the staff's thinking is still tainted by this idea that the focus on the patient can be the solution uh, to how to operate the Part A exemption. It cannot. It has to be a direct sale to the federal government. It can't just be considered to be. If it's not actually a sale to the federal government, it can't be exempt. The, so, appellant would like to close by uh, emphasizing how important it is for the OTA to, to reach and rightly decide the legal issues in this case. To avoid any possibility of getting bogged down in factual disputes about burden of proof with respect to uh, all the transactions related to the 27000 $213 refund amount at issue. In Exhibits 9 through 16, appellant has documented uh, that tax or tax reimbursement was charged by and paid to appellant's vendors with respect to uh, the seven exemplar transactions where actual or constructive possession of TPP uh, was transferred to Part A patients. Uh, had this appeal followed a typical path uh, prior to reaching the OTA, all of the transactions that comprise the $27,213 refund amount would have been validated as part of the Appeals Bureau process. But this has been a kind of an unusual path because we've been exclusively uh, focused on the, the legal issues that are at issue. Uh, but it should be noted that the department has never questioned whether appellant routinely pays tax and tax reimbursements 
to its vendors for the medical supply items it purchases that do not meet the definition of a medicine, nor does the department dispute that appellant has a Part A contract with the federal government. So, accordingly, if appellant prevails on the legal merits of this appeal, appellant believes it would be appropriate to grant the full uh, requested refund in the amount of $27,213. However, if the OTA rules in appellant's favor on the legal merits but would feel somehow constrained as to granting the full requested refund amount, the tax amount at issue for the seven exemplar transactions as previously stated and as substantiated in exhibits 9 through 16 is $50.58. Uh, the department has conceded that the this amount of tax was charged and paid, and the substantiating documentation that's been provided is consistent uh, with the type of documentation that the department would be looking at if they were auditing this. So, um, I'm not I'm not sure what other additional uh, things they they need to see. Uh, either they're a participating hospital under Part A and they they paid tax, they were charged tax and paid tax and then made exempt sales to the federal government, uh, and or they didn't. That That's pretty much what needs to be looked at. There's not fixed assets, irrelevant, uh, you know, trial, everything else that they've listed in their, their laundry list or boilerplate of things that they would like to look at are not relevant to substantiating that $50.58 amount. Uh, now, as to reaching the legal merits, uh, appellant urges the OTA to provide further clarification with respect to the presidential Talavera opinion to make it clear that the OTA is fully committed to following the classifications for regulations set forth by the California Supreme Court in Yamaha. Talavera was correctly decided because the bad debt regulation at issue, uh, regulation 1642 in, in Talavera, that that regulation is clearly a quasi-legislative quasi regulation. However, it would be very injurious to taxpayers if the logic of Talavera were applied to interpretive regulations like Regulation 1503b2 and 1591f2a. The legislature created the OTA to be a level playing field for tax disputes where the controlling statutes would be applied in an impartial manner consistent with the rule of law. Upholding the department's harmonization approach, which mistakenly relies on irrelevant plain language found in Interpretive Regulation 1503b2c, would be inconsistent with Section 6381. Under Yamaha, it cannot be the case that any regulation the department promulgates under Section 7051 is entitled to be treated with the dignity of a statute by the OTA. If the OTA were to disagree with appellant's harmonization approach, the OTA must invalidate the application of Regulation 1503b2c with respect to Part A transactions. Perhaps the biggest problem with the Department's improper harmonization approach is found in Department's Exhibit F. In the 2019 issue paper, the Department proposed the adoption of subparagraph B2d, which starting in 2019 requires both Title II and possession of TPP to transfer to Part A patients to operate the Part A exemption. The issue paper is clear that, that the department proposed this rule because the department does not believe that title passage clauses between participating medical service facilities and Part A patients have any real substance. Accordingly, the department's proposed harmonization approach with respect to subparagraph B2C lacks a rational basis for the tax treatment distinction that results between medical service facilities that have title passage clauses with Part A patients for periods prior to January 1st, 2019, and those that don't, like appellant. Classifications that have no rational basis result in illegal discrimination and are invalid. This is true whether the, the, the discriminatory tax classification is created by a statute or by a regulation or by an, er an erroneous interpretation of a statute or regulation. As discussed in more detail in appellant's briefs, while the OTA does not have the authority to invalidate a discriminatory statute, or a quasi-legislative regulation. The OTA does have the authority and the responsibility to interpret statutes and regulations in a manner that avoids discriminatory effect and preserves validity. 
In short, as the California Supreme Court held in Hughes, the uh, Board of Architectural Examiners, the OTA is obligated to avoid interpretations that would lead to invalidation in the courts. The law establishing that the department's subparagraph B2C harmonization approach would lead to invalidation by the courts is clear. In Moranville v. State Board of Equalization, the California Court of Appeal held that, quote, Section 1 of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States applies to state and local tax statutes. While the state may classify broadly the subjects of taxation, it must do so on a rational basis so that all persons similarly circumstanced will be treated alike. Rules of the agency empowered to enforce a tax which result in illegal discrimination are invalid." End quote. Under Yamaha, no reasonable California court would defer to the department taking the position that title passage clauses with Part A patients have substance, albeit unconstitutional discriminatory substance, through December 31st of 2018, but then lose their substance on January 1st, 2019. The OTA must also decline to extend such deference to the department. To be clear, appellant is not asking the OTA to rule on the constitutionality of a statute or a quasi-legislative regulation. Appellant is merely asking the OTA to observe its duty to reject erroneous interpretations of the governing statute that would create unnecessary constitutional infirmities, which is what would occur if the OTA were to bless the department's subparagraph B2C harmonization approach. In short, the existence or non-existence of title passage clauses between partic participating medical service facilities and Part A patients cannot be the determining factor for when the Part A exemption operates and when it does not. In conclusion, pursuant to Section 6381 and Quasi-Legislative Regulation 1614F, Part A patients cannot be treated as federal instrumentalities. Accordingly, medical service facilities cannot lose the benefits of the Part A exemption because they do not have title passage clauses with their Part A patients uh, to create direct sales of TPP to Part A patients. To be faithful to its calling established by the legislature, the OTA cannot defer to the administrative error committed by the department staff in 2001 when it first suggested the solution of using patient title passage clauses to operate the Part A exemption. Regulation 1503 B2C is either irrelevant to the operation of the Part A exemption or it is invalid to the extent it is applied to Part A transactions. The OTA was not created to follow or defer to interpretive recipes created by the department decades ago that contradict the controlling statutory law. It's time to reject the department's harmonization recipe and put the whole pot roast in the oven. Accordingly, appellant respectfully asks the OTA to reverse the department's action in this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ferris. Um, Judge Lee, do you have any questions? No final questions. Thank you. And Judge Kui, do you have any follow-up questions? I have no final questions. Thank you. I, I'm just going to ask um, the department to clarify the one piece that um, was um, that was raised in the closing statement about the seven transactions totaling fifty dollars and fifty-eight cents. Um, in um, the department's response to exhibits 9 through 16, while they agreed, they did say that as part of a refund examination, the department generally obtains confirmation from the purchaser that it had not already received a refund of the tax or tax reimbursement from the seller. Um, is the department proposing that if the OTA grants that refund it would be conditional on the department doing some follow-up? Generally speaking, we would um, look into whether the vendors were audited and whether similar transactions were refunded to a vendor. Um, if we're only talking about the, the limited transactions that we have here, um, we'd probably feel pretty comfortable in granting the $50 refund for those seven transactions. Thank you. Um, okay, this, um, this concludes the hearing.
and uh, the record is now closed and the matter is submitted for deliberation. The panel will meet to jointly deliberate and decide the appeal and we will issue a written opinion no later than 100 days from today. Um, I want to thank you all for your participation um, and we are going to reconvene at 1 p.m. today. Thank you. Thank you.